Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the shop. If you're new here, this is our 2013 Mitsubishi Fuso FG and we're turning it into an overland camper. In the last couple of episodes, I assembled the lithium iron phosphate battery pack and I installed the board where all the components will be placed. And there are a lot of components that need to get placed. If you're interested in using any of the components that I've used in this video, keep an eye on the screen when you see this little link truck, I've linked that product in the video description. So if you're interested in seeing how all of this stuff gets turned into the basics of an electrical distribution system, stick around. Now I know that may look like a scary large pile of components, but my system is effectively three systems combining into one. So when we get rid of the triplicates, it gets a little simpler looking. I'll quickly run through what each of the components are so you understand as we're putting things together. At the heart of the system, on the negative side of each battery bank, we will have a 150 amp daily K-type BMS. This also has passive balancing in it to make sure the distribution between the cells in each bank remains the same. I will be adding an active balancer and this will actively distribute the charge between the four cells in each battery bank. So step one from the negative terminal of the battery, we run to the BMS. On the output side of the BMS, we will run to a 150 amp bus bar. After the bus bar is where all three of the battery banks will start to get combined. All three will run to this 500 amp shunt. For those who are not familiar, a shunt is used to measure how much power is flowing through the system. This is a Victron smart shunt, which means I'll be able to monitor this on my phone or an iPad or the Victron monitoring system. The output side of the shunt will then run to this 600 amp bus bar on the negative side. That bus bar will be the main connection point for any of the systems downstream of the main battery distribution system. On the positive side of the distribution, each battery bank will have a 150 amp circuit breaker. These circuit breakers are designed to open the circuit if the current flow exceeds 150 amps so that we don't melt any wiring. The positive side of this system is much simpler. After we run through the circuit breaker, we just run directly to the 600 amp bus bar. I know that sounds like a lot of amperage in a lot of places, but I've significantly oversized all of these components so that I don't run into any issues or I'm running near the maximum for any of them. Now, speaking of maximums, there is one more component that I will be installing, which will help make the bus bar make a little bit more sense. This is a 200 amp terminal fuse. The amount of power available in this battery bank on a dead short circuit is massive. It's not unreasonable to expect that there could be between five and 6,000 amps getting out of these batteries in the case of a dead short circuit. Holy crap! This circuit breaker does not have the capability to hold back that many amps. It will arc directly through the internals and the circuit will not be opened. And this is why we use this fuse. This fuse has an ampere interrupt capacity of 10,000 amps. I'm gonna to try to make this as simple and straightforward as I can. Normal operating conditions, this should pop at 150 amps. End of the world, this is not gonna be able to hold back the power. This should pop open and be able to hold back 10,000 amps. Normally, these are designed to go on the positive terminal of the battery so that immediately following the battery, you have protection, however, they don't really fit that well for me, both the terminal size and the height that I have don't really make it work, so I'm going to do it a little bit unconventionally and I'm going to put it on the negative bus bar. They fit quite nicely here and they'll hook on the output of the BMS. This video will contain information that you may find useful if you're assembling a system such as this. However, there may be pieces of information unintentionally left out. You need to make sure that you fully understand and research what you're doing so you don't end up damaging your equipment injuring yourself or worse. I'll simulate the lightning. The first step for me is gonna be connecting the balance leads for the active balancers and the BMSs. Obviously we can't just connect a wire to a terminal. So I purchased some ring connectors and we're gonna crimp these to the ends of the wires. In addition, these balance leads are not long enough to reach from each of the cells to where the port is on the BMS. So I'm gonna to have to extend these. I've purchased some 24 gauge silicone wire to make these extensions, but obviously we can't just push these wires together. To start connecting them, I'll strip the ends off with my universal strippers. These adjust to any gauge of wire and are an amazing little inexpensive tool. 
After twisting the individual strands together, I can twist the two wires together. Okay, that was a little quick. Let me show you again. I find this method works well. I cross the two wires at about the midpoint and then wrap the tail of each wire around the other wire. The original wire from the sense lead does have the end tinned with solder, so it's not as perfect as it could be, but by pulling the connection slightly apart, it lines up with the edge of the insulation, and I can make sure to get that piece when I solder the wires together. The key to a good solder joint is to make sure you heat the wires and use the heat in the wires to melt the solder, not melting the solder on the soldering iron and hoping that it flows into the wire. That can lead to a cold solder joint which will add resistance to your connection which is not a good thing when you're trying to sense voltage. Lastly, to protect the joint we need some heat shrink and with the careful application of a way too big flame, we're done. Now it is important to note that if you're extending the wires on the sense leads that you extend them all equally and not only equally for all the wires but equally for all the BMSs. The reasoning behind this is we don't want there to be any difference in voltage because of the length of the wire, otherwise it can throw off the sensing of the BMS. With the extensions in place, I can add the ring connectors. I'll strip the wires and this time I'll fold the wire back to help build some bulk inside the ring connector. I highly recommend only using ratcheting style crimpers versus the cheap stamp type. Ratcheting crimpers only release after a full compression cycle so you don't have under crimped connections which can pull apart or add resistance to your circuit. After your crimp is complete, always pull test your crimps every single time. I've had these crimpers for over 20 years and I bought them used. They've seen a lot of use even in a commercial application and they're still going strong. Done! My next step is to connect one active balancer lead and one BMS lead to each of the three batteries within the bank. This is where things get messy. I won't tighten anything until I'm completely finished, as with this many wires, some are bound to get on the wrong side of others, but it's easy to undo one or two and reroute them. I realize right now this wiring looks like an absolute mess. Like a big spaghetti dinner. But that's what zip ties are for. That looks better. And if you think that looks like a lot of wiring, just wait until you see it with all of it hooked up. Three leads for the BMSs, three leads, for the balancers, and a handful of zip ties to keep the spaghetti monster under control. With all the sensing leads hooked up, there's one more super critical step that I need to take before I plug anything in, and that is to verify that the leads are in the correct order using my voltmeter. To do this, I've taken the negative probe of my voltmeter and put it on the negative of cell one, and then I'll probe each of the connections here. The first one I should get single cell voltage, which is 3.22 and I should go up by about 3.22 per cell that I go along in the string. This makes sure that the cells are strung in the correct order, and I need to do this on all of the balance leads before connecting the leads to the BMS or to the active balancers. And now that I'm working on a live battery system, I'll address a concern that someone raised in the comments a few videos ago. See if you can see the difference. When tightening the nuts down, I'm holding the stud still using the allen key to stop me from over torquing the stud and stripping out the top of the cell. You'll also notice I'm using a stubby wrench and cradling it with my hand. This gives me some protection against shorting out to another cell terminal, but ideally I'd be using an insulated wrench handle. I'm tightening down all of the terminals except the three main positives and negatives, which I'll just make snug since I have to attach the main distribution cables here after the components are secured. Did you catch the difference? I bet a few of you did. With all the bus bars now tightened up and we've verified all the voltages, we can install the active balancers. And I use the word install quite loosely. They're just gonna be double-sided taped to the battery trays. These active balancers just work off of the power in each cell, so as soon as I plug them in, they should start actively balancing the cells. With all the wiring done, it's as simple as plugging it in and green light. And probably more importantly, no magic smoke. Connecting the other two results in the same, so I guess my measurements paid off. Now it's just a matter of peeling the backing tape off and sticking them in place on the upper battery trays. These three batteries can now balance themselves. Although the wiring has taken quite a bit longer than I was expecting it to, I can now take this board out and start laying out the rest of the components. You know, sometimes you can have the best laid plans on everything that you're going to get done in a day, and along comes this guy. So I'm short a couple of hours today, but I have managed to get the components laid out on the board. 
and after what felt like a short sleep, I can do the final locating, ensuring that everything is square, and then drilling the mounting holes. The BMSs mount using a couple of number 6 screws, and the bus bars I'm mounting with the supplied hardware. All of these screws are just going in temporarily, and once these components are mounted, I'll take them all off again to remove the tape. A simple quarter inch thick piece of steel makes a nice consistent space between the BMS and the bus bar, where I will later run the BMS sense lead and any other of the leads coming out of the BMS. With the BMSs and bus bars mounted, the three positive breakers are next. These mount with a pair of quarter 20 bolts, and don't worry if you see that these are mismatched bolts, they are temporary. I have more on the way in the mail. Now if you're wondering how I figured out where each of these components should go on the board, I've drawn the whole thing in SketchUp in rough blocks, including the wiring. From here, I took dimensions so I could get accurate placement of the components on the mounting board. This allows me to move the components around on the computer to ensure that the heavy gauge wiring is the same length for all three banks so we don't end up with voltage differences between them. Now I can pull everything back off again, remove the tape, and then reinstall everything again. Now the next component to get mounted would be the shunt, but I'm going to hold off on mounting that until I have the wires made that run from the output fuse to the shunt. My reason for that is I want to mount the shunt as far to the left and as low down as possible, but until I've made these wires, I don't know how flexible they're going to be. And that brings me to my next problem. I haven't ordered the lugs that I need to make those wires, so for now I'm just going to place the board back on the wall. And now we can start to see the computer sketch come to reality. And with that, I think we've got a pretty decent start into the main DC distribution system for our Overland camper. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. If you've got any questions, throw them in the comments section down below and I'll do what I can to answer them. Don't forget to check out the links and we'll see you next time.